Hello, friends. I'm Evan Rosa with the Yale Center for Faith and Culture. And during these fraught and deeply uncertain times, it's our aim to seek a world in which everyone can take hold of a life that is worthy of their humanity. We want to help people envision and pursue these kinds of lives. But it's clear that in this political moment, it's not just political positions that are at stake, up the ballot or down the ballot. Our very humanity is contested. What it means to be human, who counts as human, what human flourishing might even be. So it's our mission to discern, articulate, and commend visions of flourishing human life in light of the life and teaching of Jesus Christ and fostering truth-seeking conversations among the many contending visions in our world today. And in this conversation, Yale Divinity School professor of theology, Miroslav Wolf, reflects on how to live faithfully in this political moment, the American novelist and essayist, Marilyn Robinson. Now, if this kind of conversation resonates with you, I'd invite you to subscribe to our YouTube channel on this page, but also head over to faith.yale.edu to explore many more resources, including our podcast for the life of the world. Thanks for watching today and enjoy. So Marilyn, it's so wonderful to have this conversation uh, with you. Welcome. Thank you. <laughs> it's very nice. You know, I have uh, read in this wonderful piece that New Yorker did recently uh, about you, that you, um, after college, applied to study theology, but that you were unable to do so because um, you didn't receive any scholarship. Yes, that's true. I mean, I could have done it. I just, I read omens, you know. <laughs> there was some sort of a fellowship being offered to people at Brown, and uh, I was supposed to write an essay for it. I did all that, and I thought it was quite a good essay. <laughs> but they thought they had found a better essay. I came in second, and uh, I took this to be a sign that I should do something else. I was looking for anything to tip me off, you know? So uh, it wasn't a sort of hardship thing. It was um, reading, you know, reading the signs. I think that um, administrators should have taken more care to read that application. <laughs> uh, and I can just imagine if there are any of them are living right now saying to themselves, oh my God, what have we done? We could have had Marilyn Robinson as our graduate and as a theologian. That would be amazing. <laughs> Well, you know, at that time, it was there was not any very friendly place for women in anything theology related, you know? Uh, um, yeah. And um, that was also a consideration. I I didn't, I mean, I, I felt as if I were in a larger world by going to plain old graduate school. And yeah, it may have served served you well. It hasn't served theology as well as it has <laughs> served you, but, <laughs> but, but excellent. So I will tell my dean, because he's trying to raise funds for scholarships for students. Uh, this, this is a great line. You may be missing future Marilyn Robinson as a, as a student of theology. <laughs> so I don't know whether that's going to attract people to us or it's going to detract and say, well, we'd rather have Marilyn Robinson do what Marilyn Robinson does. <laughs> Well, at least I kept I kept reading on my own, and I I don't regret that. I mean, I'm yeah. I'm to have my own reactions to things. I think is can be a very good thing. That that's that, that's really really wonderful. We'll come also to some of the theological themes, but I, I thought of starting our conversation with um, with your piece that you did for New York Times, uh, where a subtitle of the piece is "This Country is Not an Idea." It's uh, a family. And so I'd like to start by exploring a little bit more this idea of family. And later on in the essay, you mentioned also home. And this idea of home has been a, a, a very important in recent years for me. And I, in fact, right now I'm writing a book on world as a home uh, of God. And then home in this, both in a material and in social sense, and from family or private homes to uh, even global, biospheric, if you want, home. So this idea of home is really, really important. And it has been, to my chagrin maybe, um, important also to the new European right, 
as they kind of push back on preserving kind of the home and homeland of, uh, of, of, of Europe, right? So, so you can see already here tensions. And so when you write, uh, of America's family as uh, as a home, you certainly don't mean of it as kind of some idyllic and happy space. Uh, few families are uh, such, and few homes are such. And you've explored the waywardness, tensions, uncertainties, as well as intimacies and kind of positive resonances of home in your in your novels uh, very well. So when you speak of America as a family. Uh, you have some kind of belonging in view. Can you say more about the nature of that belonging? Well, you know, I think that there's a kind of, you know, th there's an arbitrariness that Americans tend not to be comfortable with, you know? I mean, in the sense that if I were to say, I love my mother more than I love your mother, it would be no reflection on your mother. It's simply the fact that, but the word my is this sort of, a, a, you know, a web that draws together all sorts of things, you know? Um, and I, <clears throat> I, I like the, I mean, I love and I'm very loyal to the fact that this country is an omnium gatherum, you know, that people uh, can apply the word my to it in all sorts of ways and so on. Mm -hmm. uh, and that, you know, and make a, a profound claim on its loyalty to them and so on in that basis. Um, I think that uh, we have, you know, people, not us especially, I mean, as you were saying, the European right also, they they make a great effort to find a defining uh, membership. You know, you have to be of a certain this and a certain that, you know. Um, I think that we have the very good historical fortune of having people be able to make the claim on us rather than our defining them, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and, and it makes us sort of, you know, a, a very interesting country that <laughs> continuously, you know, enlarges or should enlarge its conceptual basis and all the rest of it, you know, mm -hmm. just as of all the, you know, cultures and literatures and all the rest of it that we, we can absorb. So it's kind of an expansive uh, and expanding notion of uh, of family. But you draw, uh, I, I should say not but, I should say and, you draw radical conclusions uh, from, from this. In this essay, you say, a family should take practical, practical steps to ease one another through hard times to preserve the integrity of home as a special refuge. Um, what does that mean concretely for you, this easing others in time of hardship? Well, you know, I think that, you know, most of us have either had difficulty or know people who have a difficulty. Well, everybody says difficulty, right? Um, I think that there is a tendency in this particularly painful period in our, our history to talk about you know, things like losers <laughs> and so on, <laughs> you know, that to bring that kind of standard to bear as if you had to vie for the status of member of a family, when in fact, if a family's healthy, that's never an issue, you know. Um, I, I mean, I have a lot of contempt for this, uh, this idea that people can, you know, fail in a way that makes them contemptible. It's just, you know, Mozart. I mean, how many, <laughs> how many people of massive talent have in fact sort of died of malnutrition? You know, I mean, that the world is not just. Mm -hmm. And to the extent that we can create justice, we do it generously by refusing to make judgments of that kind, you know. Right. Um... And you 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 uh, root the family not in uh, blut und Boden, <laughs> as you spoke earlier. It's not territorial, or it's not uh, kind of uh, uh, based on blood relations or familial in that that sense. You you don't also I take it, and that's where I want to maybe ask you. You don't also root it in the common cultural heritage, right? It's uh, 
folks from various uh, uh, parts of uh, the world have come to this uh, country. And you speak about human beings being sacred uh, and therefore equal. And then suggests that this sacredness and equality of people, if we would just let them, they would make out of us um, a, a family. So how, how does that work? How does sacredness um, of human beings create family out of us? Well, you know, <clears throat> we are a radical departure from the order of things in the in the universe, we human beings. You know, I mean, there are all sorts of marvelous things that have, that exist that have been created, nothing like us. This incredible capacity for, you know, for creativity and honor and love and all the things that human beings are capable of that you single them out, you know. Um, I think that uh, we properly, we should be able to recognize these things in one another. Even if they're not visible to us, we should know that they're implicit there, you know, in, in the sacredness of the human being. I think that, you know, when you, uh, you know, literacy and vernacular languages and so on, passing through the world and these amazing, you know, sort of geniuses rising out of the possibility of, of access to knowledge that they had never had before and so on. Um, you, you, I think that you can extend that indefinitely, illimitably. Um, and I mean, another thing that's a great sadness to me is that it seems more and more as if there's a sort of economic rationing of, of education, uh, all this talk of elites and so on, that seems to imply that they are a closed caste that other people can't aspire to and all the rest of it. Um, everything that militates against our capacity for recognition in one another of the incredible singularity of a human being. Uh, that's a, just a loss and a, and a crime and a, something that uh, basically will recoil against us at some point. And this kind of sacredness also, in a sense, has a claim on us, right? Uh, it, 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 um, us not just to be honored and respected in a sense, uh, it's a integrity respected, but actually given for its fragility to be nurtured, to be kept in and impossibly enhanced uh, in its sacredness and uniqueness. Yes. And we know, I mean, you know, I mean, I, I, I have through the whole, you know, feminist thing up to this moment. And I know how easily people were talked out of their capabilities and their interests and all the rest of it. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, I, I had a friend in college who uh, who's, w was at the head of her class in applied mathematics and couldn't get a recommendation because her professor told her that women don't belong in mathematics. You know, I mean, things like that. It, the landscape was littered with things like that, you know, and, uh, you know, then they say, well, where are the great women mathematicians? So, you know, but people can be themselves deprived of confidence in yeah. a way that is disabling to them, you know. Yeah. Yeah. And so when we don't treat people with respect, we are impoverishing them, even, you know. Yeah, uh, it, it's and you refer here to, to here to all sacredness of all human uh, beings, um, um, not particular kind of human um, beings. Uh, it's a moral um, vision of a human family as a whole. Um, now we're living at a time of. Um, uh, re-entrenching uh, of building uh, walls um, uh, of concerns for ourselves. Uh, we are living in a time America first um, project. How does this pan-human sacredness relate to America first project? Well, I'm, I, I can't accept the terms America first and the way that they're presented and intended by Donald Trump. You know, I mean, he, he's very effectively extinguishing everything exceptional about America and um, then, you know, waving flags as he does it. You know, I, I, I mean, as far as I'm concerned, this country is an interesting, 
project, an interesting experiment. And, uh, you know, it deserves, you know, care and, and you know, enjoy. We, we could enjoy it if we tried and all that sort of thing. Mm-hmm. Um, but that doesn't, again, it's like my mother and your mother, you know. Yeah, yeah. The fact that you want to enhance your own country doesn't disparage any other country in any way. Yeah, in in some sense, right? It's it's a it's a version, uh, right, of the Christian uh, of a Christian idea of special relations. Uh, maybe we attend to our family in a special way because we have a deeper ties, um, more capacity for good, more capacity for ill uh, as well. And so it is with various levels of our uh, special relations, and the nation can be such form of special relations, which does not exclude other people as objects of our love and objects of our uh, of our care I, I, exactly. I take it yeah I take it that's in, implied in this idea of sacredness of human beings now how do you stand uh, in this regard uh, to uh, the, the, the the kind of the project of Christian nationalism yeah now I know that you uh, you, you like uh, Puritans quite, quite a bit, John Winthrop, and you and I had this interesting conversation, which we the, the, just part of it at uh, in, in New York uh, City Library, uh, where where I uh, declared my 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 greater predilection for political stances of uh, of uh, Roger Williams, um, <laughs> and, and and you've been faithful uh, in many ways to John John Winthrop. Can, can you speak about this uh, kind of Christian nationalism, which many uh, in conservative, evangelical conservative circles want to, in a sense, reclaim Christ- America as a Christian a nation, and that becomes a certain political uh, political project for them. Can you say something about that? Well, you know, I think, you know, historical context is pretty much everything. You know, these these people, you know, who washed up in Massachusetts, which is not where they intended to wash up, uh, who were aware of the fact that earlier attempts to establish colonies like theirs had destroyed in Florida and in Brazil, you know, um, that uh, they were a very small community uh, with, you know, the French Empire looming above them. And, you know, and um, uh, they were the people who would have been on the uh, the anti-royalist side in the revolutions in England, you know. Mm-hmm. So they were a very small group that grew much smaller after the first winter, you know. Um, and they necessarily... Um, I mean, this this is the kind of thing that develops very high identity among groups. Um, I think they had absolutely no idea at that point that they would be more than a colony attempting to to yeah. hold some sort of foothold in the world. You know, um, I think it's a huge error that people make when they when they project uh, subsequent history on this, you know, frail little accidental settlement, you know. Um, Winthrop talks about the city on a hill, but what, you know, what he says is people will be watching us because they were a radical uh, Mm -hmm. social order at the time. And uh, you don't congratulate yourself for the fact that you cannot be hid when you feel (laughs) that you are in peril of population. (laughs) in this kind of setting of very diverse groups of uh, folks. And by the way, we have asked uh, some of our uh, our audience uh, members uh, to pose questions. Uh, and one of those questions uh, concerns uh, Christian nationalism uh, and specifically uh, how that Christian nationalism might fit or how the notion of uh, America then might fit with uh, with with a diversity of population, religious traditions, there are many religious and our religious people uh, as well in this country. I I just I mean it is true that there are many people that call themselves Christian in this country. Um, I find that I mean if nationalism means taking care of the particular garden you have been placed in, that's fine. If it means hostility or competitiveness toward others, then it's obviously not Christian, you know. Um, Historically, uh, the word Christian is supposed to have meant Christ-like. And it seems to me as if uh, 
that should always be recognized as an aspiration, mm. not a sociological category. Um, it should also be th thought of, I think, as an aspiration that uh, we all fell short of, um, cannot claim. Um, and I think that there are things that we as Christians should recognize in ourselves and have antibodies toward uh, things like hatred and resentment and um, competitiveness that is destructive and making divisions among people that would imply um, relatively um, deficient, you know, sacredness or humanity on, on parts of disfavored, disfavored groups. Um, I think that any nationalism that claims to be Christian is probably not Christian. You have this wonderful conversation that uh, that you had uh, with President uh, Obama, or actually the other way around, that he had uh, with you. Uh, I, I was so fascinated that that he that he offered uh, uh, for you the designation of a theologian, <laughs> 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 which which he then qualified as uh, somebody who cares a lot about Christian thought. I'll take both of those as uh, as, as synonymous, and so it's wonderful uh, in that regard to to uh, claim you as part of our tribe. But one of the things that he did there, and that the two of you did in that uh, interview, is um, he connected your interest in Christianity with your concern uh, about democracy. Uh, and I take it that continues to be your, your concern, especially in the last five years, we have seen increasingly um, how democracy has lost on reputation for various reasons. And uh, one can say that in some ways democracy is in crisis. And that's not just because of an authoritarian uh, president. It's because various reasons, but also in particular, young people seem not to care particularly much for democracy. Um, um, it's it's um, they, they're interested more in achieving certain ends than in the means by which those ends are achieved. And I, as I was listening and uh, thinking about that, it reminded me of the days after the downfall of Soviet Union. Uh, when uh, Russia was going through a certain kind of uh, economic also crisis. And the question was, what's going to happen with democracy? And when I talked to some of my friends there, you know, most people, they said, think, you know, if we, if we are going to choose between bread and democracy, we're going to choose uh, bread. Right now, some people might think, well, if we need to choose between prosperity and democracy, we're going to choose prosperity. And if we need to choose between uh, whatever it is, that's what we are going to choose, as if democracy were not a value in its own right. So could you speak about your interest in democracy, what democracy, not just in what democracy can achieve? First of all, um, and this is, this is not anything that describes my love of democracy, that we are now, as all our politicians tell us, the wealthiest culture that ever lived on Earth. We have a history of, you know, of democracy by the, to the degree that this thing has been achieved that made us richer and richer and richer through generations of time. Now, if people feel that they are so hard pressed materially that they're going to throw over this great historical project, we yeah. are in trouble because that really, that's very unadmirable, you know. Um, as far as democracy itself is concerned, I think that from moment to moment, from person to person, there's a capacity for great insight, for great integrity, and so on. Not in any of us consistently, but overall, if we're attentive to each other, we have those things to learn from each other and to be guided by. Um, there is no other way of, of trying to tap this potential that exists in human beings other than democracy. Right. It's, it's a form of also deliberating about our common project, uh, shaping it together, but also that project itself is a project of deliberation. I can just think of 
um, wonderful conversations uh, that happened and exchanges that happened that are fruits uh, of democracy, uh, or at least of kind of stances at a maybe smaller scale that we might want to foster at a larger uh, scale in democratic uh, politics. Mm -hmm. I think that we have to try to give other people grounds for optimism. <laughs> I mean, yeah. you know, you, when your opinion is solicited by the general, you know, by the practices of democracy, you should be taking care that you have something of, of value to offer, I think, you know. We tend to, to slight that side of democracy. Hmm. What, did you, what do you think are the uh, kind of cultural conditions of democracy? I know uh, democratic functioning is dependent on many, uh, many things. Uh, some of them have to do with the way uh, political institutions are set up. Uh, others have to do about how our economy is set up, maybe educational system. But they're also kind of more, more narrowly cultural values that, uh, th that have to be nurtured for democracy to be healthy. I think that's true. I think that, um, but again, you know, when you look at old books that are about American democracy, um, the assumption was clearly present that we have to be sure that people have adequate historical uh, understanding, for example, you know, mm. that they, you know, that, basic education is made available at the widest possible sort, you know, so on. Um, we haven't looked, we, we act as if democracy were just a slightly more complicated way of drawing straws or something. When in fact, the <laughs> assumption behind it is that mm -hmm. the society will acculturate people to, to feel that they have soundly based opinions and that they are free to express them. But even uh, earlier, uh, I, I, I agree. So, so it's a kind of a, a nurturing, uh, uh, discerning judgment uh, and the mind um, in terms of uh, in terms of through education and, and other means. Um, but I'm just wondering also uh, about the say, say, uh, presumably something like a sense that human beings are in whatever way sacred. Maybe everybody won't express it in terms of sacredness but that they demand our, our respect. And so it seems to me that anything that undermines the respect for each individual person, um, today we think uh, of, of the discourse that we're gotten, get, gotten used to, where we have this barrage of dysphemisms that are unleashed upon, uh, especially once uh, uh, adversaries, uh, they're monsters, they're animals. Uh, it reminds me of uh, earlier vocabulary during Nazi Germany, they're all vermin and similar things you had in, uh, in, in Rwanda. Whenever you have these strong conflicts, people tend to uh, want to dehumanize uh, other human beings, let alone hold them as, uh, as sacred. And okay. so, what do you think, uh, what are the, our resources to have folks return back to holding one another sacred, okay. which is a condition of us being truly a family? Well, um, you know, <clears throat> I'm, we have a lot of very wonderful stuff historically to turn back to. I mean, mm. um, you know, these people that I read, people like Ames and Fauvel and so on, um, they uh, they talk continuously about human gifts, human capacities, kind of like Pico della Miranda or so. And they, mm -hmm. they it's an anthropology of of the brilliance of humankind, you know. Yeah. And I think that the that you know a great deal that was you know liberal that w was full of promise for future societies and so on came out of that theological view, which is not it's not about you know, angels and devils. It's about conscience and consciousness and the senses and, you know. One of the questions uh, one of our um, audience members uh, had is what is the, what do you think is the relationship between kind of structural change uh, and <clears throat> a moral transformation? Um, it seems that from some circles, at least, uh, the structural, structural change is be, uh, given, given strong uh, uh, primacy. Um, 
on the other side, you you have obviously the other uh, other side, which uh, simply think that moral transformation as such uh, is sufficient, or at least has uh, has primacy. What's your take on that? Frankly, our recent history has not interested us to believe that people are accurate in their appraisal of their own morality. I mean, there the, one of the things that drives me crazy is that many of the deprivations that are structural in the society that are people resist any change because, uh, you know, it's supposed to build your character to be insulted and injured. (laughs) 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 I don't, uh, you know, I do not share a definition of morality with people who take that view, even though they routinely present themselves as being the moralists, you know. I think we have to have a much better, much more humane and considered definition of morality before we even try to apply it beyond ourselves as standards. And of course, anyone can herself or himself be more or less as moral as he or she chooses to be. There is nobody intruding on that. Some 20 years ago, you wrote, uh, I miss civilization and I want it back. (laughs) (laughs) From the heart, from the heart. (laughs) You know, that was my mother's favorite sentence out of everything that I wrote. Oh, wow. uh, Well, that speaks well of your mother. It's it's, it's beautiful. It's so so succinct uh, and and has has an inner beauty and power at the same same time. Um, So I, I think you referred there to, I want to overhear passionate arguments about what we are and what we are doing and we ought ought to do. I want to feel that uh, art is an utterance made in good faith by one human being to another. Um, uh, Those are kind of the lines that uh, I think precede, uh, I miss civilization and I want uh, want it back. So is this about, uh, partly about what we talked earlier, uh, about seeking truth in uh, conversations, kind of some kind of a weight uh, of, um, of of importance. What, what were you pushing against uh, uh, in in, or what were you longing for when you were missing for civilization, <laughs> missing civilization? You know, one thing. I mean, many things, but one thing. Um, the the terms in which we understood our own civilization or our own culture, just to avoid confusion, um, it became very harsh. And you hear this, you know, I mean, and again, I'm talking about within the terrain of my, you know, identification. People began saying, you know, Americans only care about money. Americans do, uh, resist education. Americans this, Americans that, you know? And there was always this sort of implied but never identified ideal other of whom these things were not true. I mean, you know, if you're going to make comparisons, you have to understand that there have to be two terms at least to the comparison, right? <laughs> so, I mean, what it usually came down to is that, you know, if you imagine somebody living life perfectly, you would not find an American who did that. True, you know, um, but there's a way in which the, our, you know, we have undermined the cultural seriousness of much that we do, films and television, all sorts of things, because it, we have this idea that we're basically, you know, feeding mice to snakes or something, you know, <laughs> which is not civilization. <laughs> I think about democracy and uh, the, the almost the attitude that I perceive uh, I, that I sometimes detect in myself. If truth is against me, why should I be for the truth? <laughs> so mm-hmm. that kind of truth is uh, kind of instrumental way of relating uh, uh, to the world, uh, but not something that ought to be honored at one's own uh, own expense. Do you think something of that sort is uh, is essential to democracy for us to retrieve the value of truth qua truth. Yes, absolutely. I think that, you know, I I think that many things would enhance our capacity for democracy. Uh, Courtesy, 
yeah. you know, uh, because courtesy, I mean, at least in its best, best expressions, does not distinguish courtesy toward anyone as courtesy toward anyone else, you know. Um, yeah. And this is something that makes people available to one another as, you know, it establishes a certain level of trust, um, which we, God knows, sorely lack now, you know. And, um, you know, I mean, I think I'm just talking over the top of my head, but I think that if we sat down and thought about it, mm -hmm. we'd find all kinds of ways to enhance democracy, um, putting a huge value on personal ethics being one. Mm. Right when you when you spoke about uh, uh, courtesies, uh, obviously this is kind of almost like Victorian morality, and sometimes is is looked down upon. But but it's it's a it's a very important moral component <laughs> to it that that needs that 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 requires uh, that requires honoring. One of my favorite lines, I think, must be a favorite lines uh, or fa favorite command in the entire Bible, and it has only two words, and it comes from First Peter. And it's honor reads, everyone. Honor everyone. <laughs> <laughs> bravo, bravo. <I> <laughs> <laughs> um, but, but but it seems to me, even if one wants today to honor uh, everyone, that, that we're we're, uh, we're partly losing resources to do so. And here's what I mean by that. Um, I think honoring everybody presupposes a, a fundamental distinction between person who ought to be deemed sacred, who is sacred, uh, and ought to be uh, honored uh, as something of incomparable worth, and what they do, and even what kind of character they have, which is what we evaluate, which is what, what we say it's uh, a lesser or a greater value, which can be excellent, which can be uh, debased. But I find, uh, and I want, uh, I want to see how, how you respond to that. Uh, I'm not sure that we make that distinction readily. I mean, it's, it's baked in, it's, it's a foundational stone of, of Luther and foundational stone of, uh, of Calvin, right? Oh. The, the, this distinction between the two. But today somehow we push against it and then suddenly honor everybody becomes very difficult. How can I honor somebody who is uh, acting in dishonorable ways? Well, that's a very interesting problem, but I, I mean, I think that we always have to fall back to the position that Christianity asks it, us to do things that seem on their face impossible, you know, love your enemy and so on. So the fact that it's impossible is not uh, disqualifying. But at the same time, I think we have special problems now, uh, a kind of recurrence of something that has happened historically in the West. I think something like, I was reading some of these uh, QAnon th theories, I mean, mm. you know, memes, whatever they are, and they really, really are reminiscent of like the blood libel in the wow. period before the Second World War, where they, they create a horrific image that I think probably has a different kind of uh, place in the nervous system than something that you would think of as a reported fact, or you know, there they put they put discourse outside the range of you know the probable or the expected that we that which is the grid that we normally use to appraise human behavior to know what to assume about someone we do not know, you know. So these things are, I mean. The, more than anything else, I mean, there are lots of problems, but more than anything else, I think that's what puts the, the conversation out, totally out of whack. There is no way to respond to these things, which are, in effect, kind of sick fantasies that yeah. people can't forget, you know, and that, that contaminate uh, the people with whom they are arbitrarily associated. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, when I sometimes uh, uh, listen about about those things, uh, I, I remember uh, m my father was insistent that uh, in his present, no ill should be said of anybody who isn't present. <laughs> <laughs> that, made, that, that did not make for very interesting table conversations, <laughs> let, me tell, let me tell you. No gossip was allowed. And... and <laughs> <laughs> but but there's something there's something extraordinary I think uh, when I think about it 
uh, in a sense that, that that honors the other person and other person's kind of presumptions that they have something to say about themselves uh, in order to present themselves as they want to be seen rather than the first impression that I have of them is uh, what I will go with and I will also twist it to the more, in a more negative way to suit some of my uh, maybe fancy of a nice story that I'm telling uh, <laughs> or fancy uh, some power move that I want to make. I think that also there is in, in the consciousness that is responsive to these kinds of, of slanders, um, there is a kind of demonism, you know, as a part mm. of the construction of the world from their point of view which means that things are happening that are basically that derive from something outside human interactions. Mm. You know? um, and, you know, I mean, again, how do you, how do you speak to that? You know, I mean, but it goes right back to witch burning and all the rest of yeah, it. Yeah. 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 But uh, you speak in that um, uh, interview with, uh, uh, with president Obama, uh, that democracy requires, um, willingness to assume well about people, which means some kind of initial trust. And that yeah. trust presumes trustworthiness and therefore some kind of base goodness. Now, you and I come from, uh, from the tradition, w w which is often uh, accused of having very dour view of humanity, original sin. And I didn't know that about you either, that one of your earliest, uh, well, the text that, that that turned you toward theology was uh, Jonathan Edwards on, on original sin. <laughs> I'll have to read that. Uh, yeah, it's about all sorts of things. <laughs> <laughs> it's really about uh, time and causality. That's what it's about. Oh, I see. Well, see, see I was just going to say, I've got to read it because I've never read that, uh, that text. <laughs> where I was headed uh, with this before that digression to uh, Jonathan Edwards, where I was headed with, with this is that notwithstanding um, uh, emphasis even on, on, on tatedness of human, human beings, there's kind of um, more fundamental than this is, is a kind of primordial goodness of people notwithstanding that. And when I read your, uh, your novels, uh, that seems to me to kind of shine through uh, the kind of primordial goodness, notwithstanding the fallenness uh, frailty, uh, whatever we are, crack, cracked uh, vessels. Um, it's, can, you, uh, can you speak about bearing on this for nurturing dem democracy? Well, you know, um, I myself think of, of original sin as a brilliant idea because it means that everyone will sin and it means that I will sin too. Yeah. And that means, and and not only not out of a special viciousness of my own character, but because as a human being, that is my lot, you know. Yeah. Um, I, the, so the a categorical pardon is built into the idea of original sin. Um, and I yeah. think that that's what we need, really. I think that's yeah. a, that's brilliant, you know. Yeah. Um, I like. I mean, part of the reason I like the Puritans is because they despite this completely groundless reputation they have, they never assume their own purity or their own righteousness. That, that would, that the whole conceptual model would forbid that. Yeah, in a sense, uh, it, it's no accident that our original sin ends up being emphasized by the reformers at the same time when the idea of the grace is heightened. Uh, right. So the kind of radicality of grace kind of matches the the the, the sense of, uh, taintedness, inescapable taintedness, uh, and kind of catches it, so to speak, right? Exactly. exactly. Catches human being and notwithstanding of that. Hmm. But a default stance uh, in, in many settings, and that's also what you uh, talk about this uh, in this interview about, is, is a kind of uh, suspicion. Uh, not just mistrust for us, but, but often uh, suspicion. We approach things, uh, texts often, uh, and also people with the stance of an interrogator. Uh, texts and people are presumed to be guilty until somehow they're proven innocent. 
And I mean, anybody who looks hard enough uh, will always uh, find something to justify suspicion. You know, I was yeah. mildly interrogated uh, when I was back in, in, in former Yugoslavia uh, and serving mandatory uh, military uh, service by, by secret service. And they're constantly finding stuff that they could latch on to and interrogations can go interminably because you can always twist something to make it look uh, as if something mischievous was, uh, was going on. Uh, and, um, uh, um, but how does one, how does one uh, return to the staff? How does one see human beings with the eyes of grace, not blind to their, uh, foibles uh, and uh, and faults, but but uh, but again, as as those worthy of our affection and of nurture. Again, how do you how do you relate to the, the, the your relation to your character is what seem it seems like one ought to emulate in ways in which one relates to the concrete uh, concrete people. Well, I I you know I'm very glad that's true that you feel that way. I. Love Tell character. us your secret, though. <laughs> I'm not, I was not complimenting you simply. <laughs> that, that's well known. I want to know your secret. <laughs> <laughs> well, I do love, I love my characters. And frankly, I'm, I mean, I'm the dealer in this particular situation. You oh, know? Well, there we go. And, and I have to be fair about the fact that the problems that I create don't overwhelm me. But, you know... <laughs> 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 it's also true, I think, you know, that your good Lutheran, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, talked about costly grace, you know. Mm -hmm. And I think something that this present era of Christian thought, to the extent that it deserves the name. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. But, you know, <laughs> that it, it puts... You didn't give it a name. <laughs> 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 it puts all this into a worldly context, you know, how you have to be suspicious because somebody might intend you harm, you know, you might, you know, that used car dealer might, you know, be about to do something terrible. So you, I mean, of a financial kind. And so you have to this and that, you know, I think that um, grace, to the extent that we can offer it to one another, can be assumed to come with a cost. You know, I mean, I think that Christianity yeah. tells us that in many circumstances, you will come out on the wrong side of the thing. You know, you will you will get slapped on the other cheek, you know. Um, <laughs> that, I mean, how can we be, how can we claim to be a Christian a civilization when we put aside the most compelling and most difficult demands that Christianity makes? And they certainly mean that you honor everyone, even the emperor who probably wants you dead, you know? It's a challenge. Uh, I, I think uh, that uh, I'm returning back to democracy. It's a challenge that uh, w w we, we are presented. Uh, we often think of uh, the major issues that we are facing today um, in the current political moment. Um, are kind of political challenges of the practical kinds of uh, ways. And I, I do think that they are really very important challenges in no way I want to uh, minimize them. For instance, uh, being about uh, health care, uh, about res respect for people of, of color, uh, about environment, about uh, economic prosperity, whatever, whatever they are. But somehow I've been struck in this era how much our political challenges are challenges uh, about our humanity. Who, what, what, what does it mean to be human and how does, what is it, what's worth aspiring to as a human being and how one lives together as a community with aspiration of truly humane life. And, and I, I want to put it in those terms and somehow it seems like I'm missing uh, when I say it in those terms, it, it seems does to, uh, th th does not have hands to receive it. I think, I mean, <clears throat> there are things that we tacitly forbid one another. Um, one of them is to, to speak seriously about religion. 
Mm. One of them is to speak seriously about what is wanted from life. You know, mm. um, there's a kind of passively coercive quality in the culture that streams you along toward, you know, checking boxes and, you know, having aspirations that are really kind of below your dignity and all the rest of it, yeah, you know. Yeah, yeah. Um, and um, I think that if we could simply uh, free the speech <laughs> that is the, you know, the voice that is great within us, you know, mm. you would find that there is in the culture a huge craving for exactly yeah, the yeah. that they cannot express a craving for. Um, teaching writers, teaching young writers, one of the things that you have to do is pry them loose from the expectation that there are things they cannot write about because whatever culture gods, they even they have not even that specificity. There is just something in the culture whispering in their ears. This would not be cool. This would not be acceptable. You know, and and they don't make the test. You know, I'm I'm always telling them. I wrote about a minister dying in Iowa in 1956. <laughs> It's, how how unlikely is that? You know. Well, that's why I'm asking you this que this question, right? <laughs> because you you do it so well uh, in in, uh, in in your novels. Many conservative Christians are supporting President uh, Trump. It seems to me that when I observe behavior of and also policies of uh, of the president. Um, they, 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 far from embodying Christian values, they seem to embody almost like classical pagan values. So if you went, and by classical pagan values, I mean a, a kind of a paganism of which Nietzsche thought of himself as being a kind of retriever in yeah. some sense. And the kind of new European right has picked out some of that. There's Alain de Benoit. Uh, on on being a pagan, picks up those values. And Alain de Benoit is one of the key uh, philo philosophers of the new European uh, right. I mean, that's an emphasis on superiority rather than equality, on glory rather than on service, on heroic victory rather than on sacrifice, on pride uh, rather than humility, on tribe and not humanity. You can go down the line and you can mm -hmm. see the kind of a lineup. That's what's at the forefront. And I, I'm sometimes thinking, is, is uh, Christians are supporting this? And I'm thinking, is something like paganization of American, especially conservative Christianity going on? And it's a, it's a kind of horrible thought to entertain, but it's very hard for me to see how it is. And it's, maybe it's instrumental only, maybe it's for time being to achieve something, but it's a, it, it's deeply disturbing. It is just very deeply disturbing as far as the, you know, in terms of, you know, our life as a, as a society that, you know, deals with questions of rights and so on. I think one of the major things that has happened in my historical memory, which is long enough, um, is that people, there's been this great pivot where people in other generations tended to be to make issues around other people's rights mm. you know women's rights you know the rights of of black people the rights of chinese all this kind of thing um the people who by definition were not in positions of power are championed by people who are mm. you know um that turned around and now everyone is a fairly ferocious defender of his or her own rights which means that the idea of the of, of the culture as an overarching whole um, is, um, I mean, it, it, the idea of the wholeness of the culture is lost. There's also the fact that um, people, if they're, they can be very touchy about their rights. They can invent rights they nobody ever had before. You know, I grew up in the Mountain West and I virtually never saw a gun. Now, what in the world is this sudden everybody's bristling with armaments because the Second Amendment says so? You can't have a historical reading that history does not support, you know? Mm -hmm. I mean, this, this uh, you know, now it's gotten to the point where, you know, you can't, you can't walk up and put, you know, put your rifle in the preacher's ear. With <laughs> 
know? <laughs> this is the Second Amendment should say that I can. You know, this is ridiculous. <laughs> I mean, we've made it. We've made ourselves into these hypersensitive, autoimmune kind of creatures that think about our own good and transgressions against our own boundaries, and not, you know, we do not. Mm talk about problems in a way that would make us the help that other people need you know yeah so 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 in a sense uh, here uh, the, the rhetoric of rights in service of what's in it for me uh morality uh, or or amorality if if you want to put it that way right exactly yeah. And, you know, I mean, you, you hear these people complaining that their religious freedom is being impinged on, you know, and then you find out what the issue is and you think, well, you know, that's your religion. You live by that religion. Don't <laughs> take it to the Supreme Court, you know, because there are other rights that would feel infringed on by the expansion of your right. We used to understand that, you know. Yeah. Well, and it, and it just seems to me. Uh, I mean, I, 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 I suppose uh, I can master some kind of uh, uh, sympathy and then respond in the way exactly that you have. But on the, on the other hand, when I look at the history of Christianity and uh, how much rights of Christians were impinged upon, uh, it seems to me um, rather thin-skinned <laughs> or rather uh, frivolous to uh, insist with such ferociousness on, on, on those rights, rather than worry, again, as you've said, about uh, rights of so many people in so many places, or rights to non, non-Christians non uh, in this country being trampled uh, upon. So, so you're a Christian whose thought has been deeply shaped by Calvin, progenitor of Reformed Christianity, and I found out you believe that Martin Luther's chief Reformation tract, Freedom of the Christian, is one of the most beautiful texts in all literature. You said all <laughs> literature, not <laughs> just theological literature. This is amazing for me as, as a person who is a big devotee of, uh, of very angular and problematic uh, Luther. But, uh, and so th that's pretty, uh, pretty kind of, down to the root reformation uh, Christianity. But I think you describe yourself, and from what we have uh, now talked about, you, you describe yourself as a politically uh, liberal. And some conservative Christians might claim that you lost your faith and lost your soul. How can you do that? Uh, what's the relation for you between your Christian identity and your political identity? Well, you know, when I when I see people uh, blocking, you know, uh, rise in the minimum wage, for example, mm. or all, all these kinds of, you know, economic things that have been used or supporting a party that that suppresses the vote or so on. These things offend me religiously. Mm. You know, mm. I feel that my religious freedom to live in a country where people are fed and clothed and the imprisoned are visited and all the rest of it. My right is infringed by other people's insistence that there are higher values than that, which I don't find in the text, frankly. Um, I don't, um, God knows about my soul. One does what one can, but, <laughs> <laughs> but I find my soul a little safer among my liberal friends than I feel that it, it would be. <laughs> <laughs> In other hands. <laughs> um, so, so we, we we started with your uh, intention, original intention, to enter uh, the ministry, possible theology, um, and perhaps uh, you can you can give theologians and ministers uh, some some advice. And I mean by that, uh, you know, one of the one of the troubling features of the present uh, moment. Uh, present also political moment is that not are, only are we losing many uh, young people uh, to faith, um, America is becoming increasingly secularized. Um, and uh, some of that I suspect is happening because of the kind of problematic marriage of power and a certain kind of religion in today's, uh, in today's environment. Uh, I know that uh, 
to you as to me, Christian faith means uh, a great deal. And so the big question is, how do we help re people retrieve or come in touch at least with the beauty of faith? A kind of beauty that shines through many of your characters. What do you think can be done? What would you advise ministers and theologians like me to do? Well, one thing that I would, I mean, when you look at the reformers, our reformers, they, they, they try to get the full depth of the faith. You know what I mean? They don't, you know, so much of, of, of Christianity has gone into what it takes to be kind of survival mode, I think, where it's, a, you know, it becomes a society of nice people. Um, and, <laughs> and nothing is going to be done or said that implies that, that that metaphysics is involved, you know, that the deepest kind of deep thought is sustained by, by Christian tra tradition, you know. Um, it, it's a condescension. And it, mm. it, you know, one of the things that I have found out uh, from the way I teach, you know, the way I approach Moby Dick and so on, theology is very beautiful. Metaphysics is very beautiful. People who have never encountered it have no idea what it is and how it resonates through life and through perception and all the rest of it. Um, I think that a great many ministers have to recover the idea that they are teachers and they're, they're people who are especially equipped, one hopes, to, to open a conception of the world that no one finds anywhere else. You know, I mean, that culture is, is maimed by the loss of the capacity in the population to actually talk about these things, hmm. you know? I read that you're working on the book on uh, Christology. <laughs> and f for, for some time now, I have come to think that Jesus Christ has become a moral stranger to our current Western culture. I almost think uh, almost everything we think is really important wasn't important to him. He says almost everything yes. that was really important to him isn't important to us. Are you going to address that issue in your Christology essays? <laughs> well, I will. Uh, I have so many. I was supposed to write a book on the Old Testament, too. I don't know in what order all of these visionary books of mine will, will actually come into the world. But, you know, I was thinking, I was taking actually a course in my, by Zoom, my church, on the book of Mark. Mm. And the, that amazing impatience of Jesus yeah. with the fact that his disciples don't get it, you know. And we, you think, well, he is doing something absolutely unique, you know, in the history of Judaism or anything else. How does he expect them to understand? Mm. And then I thought, he expects them to understand the nature of God from the Old Testament and that the nature of God is the loving shepherd that tends to the sheep. The thing, you know, the God that, that does not uh, exalt himself in the sense of, of holding himself apart from humanity and so on. That if they understood the God of Moses, they would understand Jesus. You know, mm. and I think that that's that's a sort of important. You know what I mean? That's that is the kind of thing that I would take up if I were writing that essay at this moment. Marilyn, <clears throat> this is very wonderful. Uh, we could we could go on. Thank you very much for taking the time. And uh, yeah, uh, I, I I pray the strength. Uh, to you to finish all those uh, projects that I saw listed there. I, I, I need to read every one of those. Well, thank you, thank you. I will need all your prayers. <laughs> well, I'm not sure how, how, how powerful my prayers are, <laughs> but it will be a supplication before God. <laughs> thank you. <laughs>
Friends, thanks again for watching this conversation featuring Miroslav Wolf and Marilyn Robinson. And for more conversations just like it, you can find them all over our YouTube channel, which you can subscribe to on this page and our podcast for the life of the world. You can find it wherever podcasts are found or on our website, faith.yale.edu. Thanks for watching.